Thank you. If everyone's ready, we'll start the meeting. The first item on the agenda is the appointment of chair. Do I have any nominations for the position of chair and any seconders? I'd like to, just working, I'd like to nominate Councillor Dan Yates. I'd like to nominate Councillor Dan Yates. Back it down. Any further nominations? And Councillor Yates is chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just remind, uh, remind members and the public that the meeting is going to be webcast. So if you can please make sure that you do have your microphone switched on and that you do speak into it so that you can hear your voice echoing around the room like I can hear mine at the moment. Um, and that will make sure that everybody, including those that are watching on the, on the web, can actually hear what's being said rather than just hearing gaps and responses. Um, I will prompt people if their voices drop and if they're not speaking into the microphone, just to warn you, because we really do need to make sure that everybody can hear what's going on. There's also an induction loop in operation. Um, and if people are unable to make use of that, then there are hearing devices that are available to support them hearing what's going on, and Barbara Deacon, I think, who is at the back waving her hand at the moment, will be able to uh, access those for you if you need them. Um, just one other item. I have apologies from Councillor Wheels and Councillor Theobald. Do we have any other apologies at all? Okay, can I ask, are there any substitutes? Oh. Um, I'm, I'm substituting for Riziki, um, who's normally on the Children and Young People's Committee. She right, thank you. Very good. Um, can I ask for any other substitutes present to indicate, please? Okay, fine. One at a time. So, Councillor Miller and Councillor Anne Norman, are there any other substitutes? Councillor Joe Miller for Councillor Andrew Wills. Right. Oh. Bernadette Connor for Marie. If people didn't pick that up, that was Bernadette Connor for Marie Ryan, Marie Ryan from the Diocese of Arundel. Arundel and Brighton. Arundel and Brighton. Okay, and just to, um, just to give another apology to people, it may be very difficult for me to see those will indicating to speak. There's 35 people here that, you know, may wish to speak, some of whom aren't in my direct line of sight. So if you can wave as much as possible, and we'll all try to keep an eye out. Not too much, though, Maggie. Um, it is being webcast, remember. Uh, does anyone have any declarations of interest? Um, hi, I'm Amanda Mortens, and I'm a parent governor at Downs View Special School and the parent of a 14-year-old with complex needs. Thank you. Emma Daniel. I work at Hamilton Lodge School and College for the Deaf, and as far as I'm aware, that school isn't um, involved in the discussions today, but I thought I should declare that. Thank you. Okay, just to let people know, we don't have any part two items today, so the press and public won't be excluded from the meeting. Um, and can I just draw people's attention that there is an addendum papers, so there's two sets of papers that everybody should have, um, and that there's a deputation that will be heard before the main item, and an extract from the proceedings of the Special Policy and Resources Committee also included in that addendum, which was held last week on the 4th of November for information. Um, I'd also just like to suggest that the minutes of this joint meeting be referred to the next meetings of the committee and of the board, just to make sure that those are, those are approved in due time, rather than waiting until we next meet, as we only meet on a, on a slightly ad hoc basis. Moving then to item four, formal public involvement. There's a deputation concerning support for deaf children and teachers for the deaf. 
And can I invite Anna Davis to come forward and present the deputation, please? Thank you, Chair. Councillors, I am standing before you representing a group of parents of deaf children. In our city, 72% of deaf children are in mainstream schools. I would ask that you protect deaf children and young people in the area by preventing cuts to teachers of the deaf in Brighton and Hove. For the most part, we welcome the Special Educational Needs and Disability Review as a step forward to more interconnected and efficient working. Furthermore, we recognise the Council is facing considerable challenges to budgets at this time, in addition to a number of changes to SEND legislation. However, with the proposed move from teachers of the deaf to specialist advisers, we have concerns that children will no longer receive such high quality support in this area. Currently, teachers of the deaf are required to have a mandatory qualification in order to support deaf children, and we would passionately advocate that the current skills and experience requirements are protected. Councillors, all of us standing before you here are hearing we had little or no experience of deafness before our children were born, and it is a frightening place to find yourself in. In fact, 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents, and the vast majority of those children go on to be educated in mainstream schools, schools that may have as little experience of deafness as we had. Teachers of the deaf gave all of us the support and guidance we needed after our children were diagnosed. The vast majority are just a few weeks old. Their wealth of experience helped us to become deaf-aware parents in those crucial early years. They offered guidance through nursery and preschool, and when the time came, they worked with our children's teachers and support staff in mainstream schools. Our children are all success stories all in local schools with local friends. They work extremely hard to achieve what they do, and we need to ensure that they are met halfway with this challenge. Councillors, even with a minor hearing loss, a child's education would be dramatically affected if the correct support is not in place. For example, a child with just a minor hearing loss will miss between 25 and 50% of what a teacher says and will not hear anything if sat at the back of the classroom. Teachers of the deaf ensure that teachers and fellow pupils alike are trained in best classroom practice. They assess the technical support which each deaf child will benefit from, and they train the child, the parents and teachers in that essential technology. If I encourage my child to skip school for a day, I would be fined in recognition of the value of the learning he would miss. If a deaf child isn't supported sufficiently in the classroom, that missed learning will cost a whole lot more. By bringing this deputation, we want to ensure that the number of teachers of the deaf is protected and that children with and without education, health and care plans are well supported. On the desks in front of you sits a detailed account of our stories. In particular, we've written about the support we have received from expert staff and how this has enabled us to better support our children. They've helped us in so many ways, ways that I have barely touched upon here. Councillors, I do hope that you can take the time to read our stories and that you will understand then why we are so passionate about these proposed changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, Thank you, Ms. Davis, for attending today's joint me meeting. Just to, just to confirm the, uh, the authority's position at the moment, the, the authority remains committed to meeting the full needs of our children with hearing and visual impairment. Uh, we value the professional specialist qualifications that teachers of the deaf and visually impaired bring to the service and intend to retain these in the new service. There's no intention in the proposals to reduce the support available for children with hearing or visual impairment and all, sense, all children with sensory impairment will continue to get the support they need from a specialist and experienced team of advisors and support staff. 
There are a range of anticipated benefits from the, from the new service. Uh, greater flexibility from an integrated team of 55 staff from various professional backgrounds, including educational psychologists and primary mental health workers. Uh, a reduced back office and management time with renewed focus on frontline services for schools and families. Uh, new special educational needs advisors working across the year rather than term time only to provide a more complete service for families and young people and a service that works with all ages from birth to 18 years rather than to 16 years as at present. Um, the council takes the concerns of parents very seriously and regrets any unnecessary anxiety or concern that's been raised following the consultation with staff from our learning support services. And in, re in response to the deputation, we'd like to make the following points. Um, the that's exactly the same writing as I have previously, so you don't want to hear me saying the same thing twice, otherwise that does look like a web mistake. Um, we know that senior officers from the local authority have been in conversation and have had meetings with representatives from the National Deaf Children's Society and sent out a briefing to them to reassure parents. Um, and senior officers are also arranging to meet with parents and carers of children with hearing impairment to listen to their concerns and to provide further reassurance. There have no, been no decisions made in relation to the proposals as of yet. It's currently a consultation with staff which is set to conclude at the end of January next year. Uh, we welcome parents and young people contributing their views which can be given the fullest consideration via, uh, and then there's an email address, sen.team at brighton-hove.gov.uk. And I really would encourage everybody that wants to contribute to that consultation to give their input to, uh, to do so because we want to hear the most possible views of everybody that's going to be affected or that, ha or that cares about the delivery of those services. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to... Oh, sorry, there's an indication. Um, so, are, are we discussing this in, in any format at all? Because um, it's, it, it, it's a, something from the public, and I, I think we should give it some time, if that's possible. Um, for myself, I uh, just wanted to say, first of all, that within the press, etc., cetera, um, we've seen recently that um, a lot of this reorganisation, which looks like a very good reorganisation of services, um, in management and in putting things together in the same uh, same area and uh, using best uh, best value for money has, has been very positive. But um, it's also been stated that this was all agreed at our last meeting. Um, now, a paper that was put forward to us at our last meeting um, was uh, quite vague on, on the detail on this sort of thing and basically was, was shown as an amalgamation of service in that it would provide within buildings a better use of buildings, uh, a better use of management, etc., and reduction in that way. Um, it certainly didn't show that there would be any change that may um, actually and I have, I have also backed this up and asked questions from officers that would actually cause a reduction in capacity. And I think, in fact, even at that last meeting, I asked about capacity, and there were no details, and we were told that an equality impact assessment would be brought forward showing us if there was anything, because we had nothing on equality impact at that meeting. Um, and for those reasons, I feel that you know, we have an equality duty when we're making any decisions. And as a, as, a, as a board, we have equality duties and the duty to be to improve equality. Um, and we need to look into this, especially the side of putting uh, some of the capacity. We're saying uh, that schools will take that up. Governors at schools will add some of their resources to take up some of the strain, etc. This has not been agreed at this point. So we need to understand that we're rushing very quickly to this um, without going through what I would see as the correct process, especially if it has been stated that we have agreed this and we agreed that this should go to consultation in this, in this manner. Um, and further, if we are having a consultation, <laughs> right from the start, consultation should be with end users. And we're hearing deputations now for the first time um, and 
there's been no consultation put in place with the end users, which again, for equality reasons, with disabled children, um, should have happened. Councillor Phillips. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to completely concur with Martin and what's just been said about the process of this, which is deeply flawed, I think. Um, and on another, on another separate note, you know, as a teacher and someone who's been reliant in the past on these specialist teachers, um, I am concerned about the terms and conditions and pay and so forth, if they are going to be, in effect, downgraded to, um, to not be teachers anymore and be some for, form of assistant. Um, because as the deputation um, laid out, it is really important for teachers and also other pupils to learn about how best to interact with people who are hard of hearing or deaf. Um, and certainly other pupils as more and more in schools group work and so on and so forth is used. So I'm really very concerned about this sort of declassified declassification, if you like, um, of these teachers um, and their terms and conditions and pay. Okay, now obviously I wasn't at the, last, at the meeting where this proposal was agreed back in February, um, and as a result I can't necessarily speak on the detail of that paper, but I will ask the Director of Children's Services to perhaps comment on the process and where we are at the moment. As far as I understand it, the reason to consult people is to get people's input and to share ideas at a, a relatively sensible stage when there are formed opinions but not necessarily decided opinions and to make sure that that comes back and is reported through the appropriate route. So from my perspective, there are, with any consultation, if you consult too late once decisions have been taken, you're not consulting at all. You're just telling. So there's a balance that needs to be found between the two, clearly. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you're quite right. This was discussed in February at the previous joint session of the Children and People, it was at that point Children and People's Committee and the Health and Wellbeing Board. And what was decided at that uh, meeting was a decision to integrate the different services. The detail associated with that wasn't presented in that, in that meeting, so it was the principle of the integration of those uh, different learning support services. What we have initiated is a consultation process with staff around the best way of doing that. Um, that has generated a considerable uh, amount of um, correspondence and contacts and uh, as a consequence we've been having a number of meetings with different uh, parent groups and, with, uh, and staff groups as well. The consultation is absolutely not closed, it's continuing through till uh, the end of January as the Chair has already pointed out. Um, this consultation is an unrelated point to the proposal that's coming to the meeting today. So today the meeting is around provision for special educational needs and disability and that proposal that's just been referred to relates to learning support staff who are primarily working with children who are in mainstream schools in, in, in the main. Um, there was a particular point in terms of uh, terms and conditions of staff. So um, it's not the case that we're looking to uh, move teachers out of uh, teachers' paying conditions to um, unqualified positions. The proposal is that there's a balance of staff. Uh, so there will be staff who have qualifications, the relevant qualifications. So, for example, qualified to teach uh, children hearing, hear, hearing impaired. Uh, that they would be uh, on an advisory grade, which is a Solbury grade. So it's still a qualified grade. It's a Solbury grade. Uh, there will also be unqualified staff or staff who don't have those, those qualifications. And that's the case at the moment. So at the moment there are staff who are form part of the learning support service who are not qualified teachers. And there will continue to be staff who are not qualified teachers in the, in the new service. The exact balance of those staff will change a little bit. Uh, but we're also looking to ensure that the Solbury staff are able to work uh, during the um, school holiday periods and then provide support directly to children and families in their home situation. The total number of staff, I think, I haven't got the figures in front of me, I think it's three, three less than the current service, but that is still a proposal and that, 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 propo that process hasn't, hasn't completed. Uh, yesterday we met with a number of staff and agreed at that point to um, consider some of their thoughts and proposals and we'll be coming back to, back to staff groups to discuss that in more detail through to the end of January.
Councillor Phillips. You mentioned a figure of three staff, but that's out of how many at the moment? And um, what's the proposed balance of unqualified and qualified staff members in the future? You said that balance won't be the same as it is currently. And my real uh, concern around this is that we're going to have a greater number of unqualified staff in the future. I'm afraid I haven't got the exact details in front of me because I wasn't expecting a debate on, on, on this matter, so I don't have the, the, the precise details. My recollection is that there are currently 58 staff and that it's moving to 55 staff. Um, my recollection also is that there will be 15 uh, advisory staff. There are also seven point something, I can't remember the exact number, of uh, teachers who we will be in discussions with schools. Um, they are traded service at the moment with schools. So to continue with that traded offer, offer to schools. And the remaining staff, whatever that is, minus often 55, would be non-qualified staff. But there are a considerable number of non-qualified staff in the current services. It's not the case that they're all teachers. But I'm afraid I don't have the details in front of me at the moment. I'm afraid I can't take questions from the floor. I'm sorry, that's, that's, not, that's not possible within the rules at the moment. Okay, I would propose that we move on. Like I said, I'd really like to thank the deputy for, for coming along and for raising this issue. It's, it's an important part of a consultation process to be able to air your views how, wherever you air them, and I think they've been duly noted here by the, by the director. Yeah? And the committee, obviously. Both committees, in fact. Can I ask that um, at the end of this, is it actually going to come back to this committee? I mean, you're having a consultation. Where is it going after that? Because it's bypassed this committee, as far as I'm concerned, the, mm. the, the, this, this, this detail. Um, and it wasn't agreed, this, this sort of change on you know, funding and how, how it's going through. So I would like that to come back. If it's not coming back here... Where will it go back to? Will it go back to your committee? Um, speaking as the lead member for uh, Children's Services and the chair of the committee, um, as uh, the director has pointed out, there is an existing consultation that's in place. Actually, a decision was taken at um, a meeting yesterday to extend the consultation to the end of January with the uh, learning support team. That does mean, actually, that uh, any implementation now of any agreed arrangements will be in place from September of next year, not um, the planned April. Obviously, the amount of concern that has been uh, generated out there, and I'm acutely aware of that, um, and of course we've heard from uh, a deputation today, uh, there will be a petition, I think, that will come to full council uh, in December. So I'm actually proposing that this uh, decision come to full council uh, in uh, December. Thank you. Sorry, I thought the issue was about um, ensuring that there was an ongoing process of discussing, not making a decision, because obviously the consultation doesn't finish until the end of January. That's fine. Oh, that's fine. Sorry, Chair. It, 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 the way you said it could be may sounded like we were making a decision at full council. Yeah. We won't. We will hear that petition, yes. um, and it will That's be right. part of the consultation process, which finishes in January. I don't know whether we'll convene a joint meeting again or we'll take it separately. I'm not sure what the process is, but we have agreed with um, the unions that we spoke to yesterday that we would take, we would hear them after they, the, the, the officers' report came as well. Absolutely. I mean, we are in a consultation. Um, staff are in various uh, workshops and consultations with our officers, and, you know, the situation is changing all the time. Given that there is the petition that's coming to full council, we will be able to um, give an update at that point to full council. But in terms of the decision, that should come back, in my view, to the Children's Committee after the staff consultation period was formally closed at the end of January. I'll just clarify that, Chair. If everyone's content over item four, we'll, we'll proceed to item five. Now, just to, just to warn people, item five is going to be 
intensely complicated because obviously we're, as I've already said, we're a joint committee. I intend to take a, a full debate from, from the committee and the board and all members of the committee and the board. Uh, and then after that, we will open, go through each recommendation item by item to make sure that we're very clear. And I will make very clear at the point of voting exactly who's supposed to be voting and who isn't supposed to be voting. Because we have, we've got three categories of voters, potentially, as well as an additional category of people that speak that haven't got a vote on any of the matters. So it's important we know who's who. And in order to make sure we know who's who, as we're getting to that point, I'd actually like to invite everybody to introduce themselves so that they can make it clear who they are and why they're here to the members of the public. We have a lot of members of the public here, and I would like them to understand why everybody's sat around the table. So I'm going to start from my right, your left. So good afternoon. I'm Pinky Goshal. I'm the Director of Children's Services. Uh, I sit on the Health and Wellbeing Board, but I'm a non-voting member. I'm here today in this table because uh, the Chief Executive is not able to be here, so I'm taking his place. place. Uh, Councillor Tom Buick, a lead member for Children, Young People and Skills and Chair of the relevant committee. I'm Daniel Yates. I'm the lead member for Health and Wellbeing and Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I'm Natasha Watson. I'm the legal advisor to the Health and Wellbeing Board and the uh, Children, Young People and Skills Committee. My name is Lisa Johnson. I'm from Democratic Services and I'm taking the minutes for the meeting. If we start at the back. I'm Denise D'Souza. I'm Director of Adults and a non-voting member. I'm Public Health and a non-voting member. Graham Bartlett, I'm the independent chair of the Local Safeguarding Children Board and Safeguarding Adults Board and I'm a non-voting member. Hello, I'm Frances McCabe. I'm from Health Watch Brighton and Hove and I'm on the Health and Wellbeing Board and I'm non-voting. Frances, can I just ask you to point your microphone a little bit less to the ceiling? What? what this way? Say no, it again. This way. That's better. Do you want me to say it again? Yes, please. Hello, I'm, uh, gosh, <laughs> I'm Frances McCabe, um, I'm um, Health Watch Brighton and Hove, I'm on the Health and Wellbeing Board and I am a, a non-voting member. <laughs> Councillor Caroline Penn, uh, lead on mental health and I have speaking rights on the Health and Wellbeing Board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Barford. I'm the lead member for Adult Social Care and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board and voting member. I'm Claire Holloway. I'm the Interim Chief Operating Officer for the um, Clinical Commissioning Group and I'm a voting member. Hello, I'm George Mack. I'm the lay member for governance on the Clinical Commissioning Group governing body and I'm a voting member of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Hello everyone, um, I'm Councillor Phelan McCafferty. I am the Green Group spokesperson on the Health and Wellbeing Board. Hello, I'm Dr. Krista Beasley, Chief Clinical Officer for the CCG. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Anne. Just gone off again. Um, I'm Anne Norman. I'm actually a substitute here today for Councillor Geoffrey Theobald and a voting member. Hello. Uh... Hello. I'm Ken Norman. I'm the Conservative spokesperson for Adult Social Care, Health and Wellbeing. Hello. I'm, I'm Daniel Chapman, and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Mo Marsh, member of the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. And I'm a voting member, as is Councillor Chapman. Oh, I am Councillor Maggie Baradal. I'm a member of the Children, Young People and Skills Committee, and I'm too am a voting member. I'm Councillor Emma Daniel. I'm lead for Neighbourhoods, Communities and Equalities, and I'm a voting member on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Brown. <coughs> I am the Conservative spokesperson on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee and a voting member. 
I'm Councillor Nick Taylor. I'm a member of the Children's Committee. Uh, Councillor Joe Miller, I'm substituting for Councillor Andrew Wales, who's a voting member for the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. I'm Councillor Alex Phillips. I'm the Green Group spokesperson for on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee, and I'm a voting member. I'm a councillor, Amanda Knight, and I'm a voting member on the Children's Young People and Skills Committee. I'm Anne Holt. I'm Diocesan Director of Education for Chichester Diocese. I'm a co-optee to the Children, Young People and Skills Committee and a voting member. Uh, hello, I'm Martin Jones. I'm Parent Governor, Voting Co-optee on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee and have votes on educational matters. I'm Amanda Mortensen. I'm a parent governor on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee and I'm a voting co-optee. Good afternoon. I'm Bernadette Connor. I'm Deputy Director for the Catholic Diocese of Arundel and Brighton and I think I'm a voting co-optee. I think, I've got, I think I've got the measure of the machine yeah. now, too. <laughs> You've done better than me, then. OK, if we start at the back. Um, Reuben Bratt, I'm standing in today as a non-voting member um, on the Health and World... No, the, the Children, Young People and Schools Committee. Um, I'm a Youth Council member. I'm Amy Louise Tilly. I'm a member of the Youth Council representing young people on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee, and I'm a non-voting member. I'm Sue Shuva. I'm the chair of Sussex Community NHS Trust, which provides community health services for adults and children. Um, I am a non-voting co-optee on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. Ben Glazebrook, a community voluntary sector rep, on the Children, Young People and Skills Committee, co-optee, non-voting member. Thank you, everyone. Let's hope that we don't have to do that too often. Um, just, to, just to commence, then, if I can ask the Director of Children's Services and Director of Adult Services to introduce the item, and then we'll move on to the detail of the item from the team that have assembled down the end. Thank you, Chair. I'll start off and then uh, my colleague will say a few more words in relationship to adults. So I just wanted to remind the committee that we debated uh, um, some principles uh, in February uh, and uh, in a joint session and in a different venue of the Health and Wellbeing Board and the Children and Young Peoples uh, as then was committee. And what we agreed was a range of principles and uh, agreed that we would then move that forward to develop some more uh, detailed proposals and that's what's coming to, to the committee and to the board today. Um, in terms of the paper, I'm not going to say a lot, I just thought it'd be useful just to remind members that the principles uh, for the, um, the proposals in relationship to children are set out in paragraph 2.16. Um, so there, there's some very clear principles and those were the principles that we discussed in the February meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board and the Children and Young People's Committee. And we thought it would be helpful in terms of bringing to life the, um, the intended outcomes of this proposal um, by putting the points out on paragraph 2.15, which are in those sort of, not short colour that is, but slightly dark coloured um, area, just to, to kind of exemplify what we're trying to do through, through these proposals. And my colleagues at the end will provide a lot more detail in relationship to this. Finally, I would just like to apologise for the number of recommendations that are on the report, which will probably take us some time to get through. It is a complicated matter. There's quite a lot of stuff to, to, to formally agree. So there are quite a number of recommendations, but I have every confidence in the Chair. And if I hand across to um, Denise D'Souza. Thank you. And um, like Pinnocky, in uh, February at the Health and Wellbeing Board, we agree the, uh, the vision for adult social care loan disabilities following an independent review that took place about this time last year. And I think one of the things that we, we looked at when we looked at that review and what's um, in, in Section 5 of the paper is some of the areas where it's quite clear that there were some issues in relation to, to, to transition. So it made sense as we began to think about the review for adults where that crosses over um, 
with, with children, and one of the biggest things we heard is the issue in relation to transition, um, which we know because of the different age, the age ranges, there's, there's always a cliff edge somewhere. So in 3.5 and 3.51 through to 3.56 on a range of recommendations, mainly to explore further where we can work better together um, and look at some of the options for trying to avoid some of those, those cliff edges, um, such as use of, um, currently we have two teams, we have an adults team and a children's team, we have a trans transition team. Is there, is there ways we can do that better? We need to explore that. We need to think about personalisation and the resource allocation system. And again, if we we've currently have one for adults, it would seem to make some sense to do that for, chil uh, for children, and that be that they'd be sort of compatible. So, they're the recommendations, and I'll, I'll leave it to uh, uh, Reagan and, and colleagues to uh, give further detail. Okay, so if I can ask Reagan and her team firstly to introduce themselves, and then we'll then to introduce the paper in more detail. Hello, my name is Ellen Mulverhill. I'm Head of Behaviour and Attendance for Brighton and Hove Schools. Hello, I'm Cameron Brown. I manage the Community Learning Disability Team for Adults. Hi, I'm Regan Dell, and I'm Regan Interim Assistant Director across uh, Adults and Children's Services with responsibility for SEN uh, and learning disability strategies and reviews. Hi, I'm Renee Padfield. I'm Head of Commissioning for Mental Health and Children's Services at Brighton and Hove CCG. My name is Jenny Brickell. I'm Head of Disabled Children in Brighton and Hove. Okay. Yeah. Because it's quite a long and complicated paper, we thought it might be quite good to go through a, a short PowerPoint. Um, it's probably easier for me to do that um, in just in terms of coherence. And then uh, between us, we'll respond to questions. Um, so uh, I don't know whether people can see the um, PowerPoint up there. We did bring some slides with us, but probably not enough. But I'll just, I'll just give it a go. Um, we've got two sets of proposals here. One is about a proposed merger of, of, of relevant functions and services across children's services and adult social care. Uh, and a key driver for this is the legislation which now asks us to create a smooth pathway for young people from 0 to 25 years. Uh, and as Denise said, we don't want to create another cliff, but it is actually quite a challenge for us to do that 0 to 25 years pathway because so many of our services start and stop at different points along the way. We've had lots and lots of feedback from families. They find this very difficult and challenging and rather scary, um, and, and young people as well. Um, and the second set of proposals is about working up and consulting on our special provision for children and young people with the most complex SEN uh, um, and disabilities. And that's our children that are in special schools, our children that are in pupil referral units, our children in our specialist nursery provision, um, uh, and sort of indirectly those children that we have in uh, independent and non-maintained provision outside of the city. Have I got an echo on this? Does it... It's all right, is it? Good. Okay. Um, the first thing to say, I'd like to say, is that what we're seeking here really is a, approval to work up and consult on these proposals. We're not coming saying we've made hard and fast um, recommendations here that are, are finite and uh, there's no other options. We've put some options in the paper. Um, we're bringing to you where we've got to, essentially. Um, and if there's a direction of travel approval on that. We'd like to work up in some more detail and bring the proposals back again in a more final, in a more final form. Uh, but having said that, this does represent an awful lot of work to get to this point and an awful lot of 
consultation and informal conversations. We had a really big consultation in the autumn and spring uh, of 14-15 that led up, as Pinnocky said, to bringing a report in February. That was a really big formal consultation and many, of, many, many people took part in that. Since that point, we essentially had lots and lots of informal conversations with lots of stakeholders, lots of discussions between ourselves and colleagues in health, colleagues in schools, um, with parent groups, etc. And I suppose now what we're saying is we want to go through, if the direction of travel is approved, to a more full and formal consultation process again on these proposals. So, I think somebody's doing the PowerPoint for me. Yes, it's already done. Good. Um, we've got some, there's some key themes that cross the proposals in adults and children's services. And they are born really out two sets of legislation, which I know colleagues will be familiar with, but in 2014, we had a new Children and Families Act, and we also had a Care Act in, social, uh, in adult social care. Um, and the group of young people that we have between the ages of 19 and 25 are covered by both of those acts. Uh, and also, we need to pull out the common themes which are around personalization, making sure that everybody has their own plan rather than a sort of factory plan, but that's personal to them. And that where possible, we empower families by allowing them to have personal budgets and have more control over what resources they need to meet the individual needs of their young person or if they're adult service users, their own needs. So that's a key driver in both children and in adult social care and across health and care services and education services where well, that's a common theme in everything that's directing us there. Makes a lot of sense to join that up and look at it all together, which is what we're, we're wanting to do. Uh, a second theme is integration and, and you know that there is a real national driver for health um, and council services to work together to provide a more integrated uh, service, a more holistic service, whether it's a child or an adult or, or somewhere that's on the pathway between uh, childhood and adulthood. Um, and a third key principle is about consolidation. We live in tough financial times. Uh, none of us want to step back from high quality provision for our service users, particularly uh, very vulnerable service users. But sometimes when we have to look at things more clearly, we can see ways in which we can improve services at a better price. And that's really what we're trying to do here. There's nothing in these proposals that wouldn't, in my view, make for a better service for our children and adults. I think it would make it better. But we can see ways by consolidating less buildings, less infrastructure, reduced back office and management costs, we can find ways, we think, to do this at a better price. Okay, Ed. Okay. I'm so sorry it's difficult to read. Um, I'm going to just briefly mention the proposals around merging some functions across adult social care and children's services where young people have special educational needs and adults have learning disabilities. Um, and We currently have an autism strategy in adult social care and an autism plan in children's services. But people with autism, their children and then their teenagers and then their adults, and we can see a lot of merit in looking at that as one pathway. Um, similarly, um, we now have, uh, I won't go into the detail, but we have a requirement to really sure, make sure that we're not unnecessarily depriving young people or adults of their liberty. So we're not, you know, sort of thinking it's okay to lock the front door because they might run in the road without really carefully checking out whether that's necessary or whether we're actually in some way taking away people's rights. Currently those processes for looking at that go on separately in children's service and adult service. It just makes a lot of sense to bring that together because essentially we're looking at the same thing. 
Equally, adult social care now have a resource allocation system. It doesn't mean that people don't do really thorough and careful assessments of families, just the same as we do in children. But just to make sure that it's fair and equitable, we use a resource allocation system and we're proposing to use a similar resource allocation in children's services so that we look at it quite seamlessly. It doesn't mean that we're considering everybody the same, I hasten to add. There'll still be the high quality age related assessments underpinning that. But it is just to make sure that we are looking fairly across the whole piece uh, so that when there are resources and families need them, that they get them on a more equitable basis. Uh, so that's another area. Um, and the, um, I suppose the thing that we are seeking approval to consider, because we're not totally sure whether it's the right thing to do, but we think it might be, and that's to think about combining the assessment, social work assessment teams across children's services and adult social care. Because after all, if it's one pathway, shouldn't it be one team? But then there are issues about different age groups as well. So that's, we want to consider whether that's the right thing to do. We think it probably is, but we're not, we, we can see the other side of that as well. So we just want approval to consider that further. If I move over to the children's services proposals, here, these are very much in, in we, we had an at SEN review made lots of recommendations. This is one particular area, which is how we organize our special provision. When we did our consultation with families, one thing they said to us was that they still, and I think we are better in Brighton and Hove than the rest of the country, but still, according to our families, not quite good enough at integrating our provision across education, health and care. So some families were reporting to us they still found that quite fragmented. They still had to pick up things in too many places. They felt that there sometimes wasn't one plan across professionals and that maybe professionals hadn't consulted with each other. So what we wanted to do was really bring that together in an integrated way. Definitely something that the New Children and Families Act encourages us to do. So that's very central to the vision here. Um, we're jointly commissioning the provision between ourselves and health so that obviously if we were going to have education, health and care in one place, whether you're a preschool child or a school aged child or you're 16 plus, if we were going to do that, that has to be something that ourselves and our partners in the CCG need to work on together because that's quite a big change from the way that we, we do things now. But we are... There are other places in the country that have already done this, and we've visited 22 different providers. We had some of them come to talk to us. We had a conference back in March. So we know that other parts of the country have outstanding provision that already does this. Different models, and, and we don't want to copy any of them. We want our own model that takes the best of all of it. Um, but even though we do things well, there are parts of the country doing it better, and we want to learn from them and do it, do it better here ourselves. Um, we don't want to make all the good things that you can have if you have special educational needs and disabilities in special schools. We really want that. We want to preserve our inclusive uh, approach to things in the city. So all families who want a mainstream education, we are totally committed to making that work for them. But what we do feel is there's a bit too much of a divide in the city between a mainstream education and a special education. And we'd like to see... Uh, a bit of a ladder going up and down between those two, more shared activities, uh, more things going on, opportunities for young people in special schools to do some of their lessons in mainstream school and vice versa, so that we've got something that's a bit more personalised and a bit more of a mix and match according to the actual needs of the child. And we're also mindful of the social opportunities that mainstream provides. So we're looking at having lead partner primary and secondary schools working with our special provisions um, uh, to, to make that happen. The other thing that was a real um, point that families made to us when we did the consultation is they just did not feel if they have children with complex needs or children with challenging behaviour and sometimes with both, they just did not feel they had easy access to the support they needed. Sometimes they felt that 
you know, they would go to an appointment with a professional who might be really, really good and they might make a suggestion and they'd come home and that suggestion didn't work and then there'd be a six-week wait or something for the next appointment, etc. It just didn't feel immediate and it didn't feel necessarily quite what they needed. Families told us from little pilots that we'd done how much they appreciated sometimes school staff coming or staff from the um, care, local care settings who often had lots of experiences and real practical ideas to share with families about how to approach things. And we'd like to do more of that. So if we're integrating our provisions, we want them to provide support to the families of the children that go there in a very much more direct way. So that's just a little bit about what we're, we're pitching at. Um, Pinnocky mentioned something about the core principles. What we're no, absolutely not advocating is any reduction in the special school places that we offer. In fact, the proposals we've got on the table at the moment are recommending a few more places uh, in areas where we feel we need them. Nor are we recommending any reduction at all in frontline teaching, pupil teacher ratios or support staff for our children in special provision. That, that's definitely not in the recommendations. We value that. We know children in our special provision need intensive support and, and we intend for them to get it and more through these proposals. Obviously, I've said something about integrated provision, so I won't say any more than that. But if we did go with some proposals on these lines, the, what we're suggesting is it would be phased in over four years because what we're really sensitive to is the kids who are already in the system. We don't want to disrupt their education. Um, and every child, if we did go forward on something on, on the, on, as the plans outlined here, we would make sure that every child had a personal plan. So nobody's learning was interrupted, nobody's well-being was compromised, and that families had real choice. So it wouldn't be a case of saying, right, you're here, now you move there. That wouldn't happen. That would be something that would be absolutely sacrosanct. Uh, that won't, won't be the case. Um, there's a slide there. It's quite a busy slide, but it's just going through some of the, some more of the things that we're wanting to achieve, better outcomes for our children. In some ways, we have been improving the outcomes for our children with SEN, but it, it kind of... It starts better than it finishes. So we do reasonably well in primary. We have improved outcomes, especially this year for children in our secondary schools with special education needs and disabilities. But further on, when you look at the not in education, employment or training, as children get older, it's a really sad story. And by the time children are reaching 19, 20, we're looking at neat figures, as we call them, not in education, employment and training, of around 40, 50 percent. So it's a very big investment in our children as children, but it's not necessarily translating into a sustainable adult life. And we need to be better at that, so we're pitching at that. More vocational opportunities, more apprenticeships, supported internships, a, a clearer vocational pathway than the, the one we have now. Um, I'm only just going to pick out a few of these. It, another thing is that although we offer, I think, really very good provision for our children and young people, we have excellent special schools and Peru's Ofsted confirm that time and time again, there are still quite a number of our families who feel they need to look outside of the city for the exact match of provision for their children. We don't want that to happen. We want all families to be able to find what their children need in the city. Better for children. Who wants long distances, long journeys, possibly a residential school away from your family? People don't really want that. Um, and secondly, just in terms of uh, better value for money, it is definitely better for us to keep our children in the city um, in excellent provision that meets all of their needs because we actually spend a very, very large sum on children going out of the city with special needs, um, disproportionately large, and it's very difficult for us to control and manage costs um, in that area. Obviously, there'll be some children with very, very exceptional needs we'll always need to look for a particular provision for, but in the main, we could do much better in the city, I think, especially if we had the integrated education, health and care provision. Um, the other thing that 
the way we provide for things at the moment, as I say, I think we provide really high quality, but financially, um, because we have so uh, six special schools, two pupil referral units, and two, uh, a specialist nursery on two sites, the actual costs of the provision are quite high, uh, and some of our schools are very, very small. Um, you know, our smaller school has 31 pupils at the moment, um, and the average size of our special schools is 70. Now, that does actually mean that the unit costs are quite high. Um, it also means that there are some things that are lost in that. There's some things that are gained, but there's some things that are lost in terms of teachers' ability to work and plan together uh, for children of the same age and, and, and a sort of general curriculum, uh, running a curriculum that is a real secondary curriculum in particular uh, for our young people. So we think it would be a good idea to consolidate them. Because some of our special schools get so small, um, it isn't, they're not financially viable in our current situation where the money follows the child in real time. I won't go into too much detail because it's in the report, but it ends up that in order to keep the schools going and sustainable, we have to pay what's called transitional protection. Um, and that, 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 in a sense, is money that doesn't end up on children, it's just to sort of keep the school going, um, and that's worked out at about £900,000 over the last five years, and that's money that could be spent much more directly on children with special needs, and, and believe me, we have pressures on that. We really do have pressures on that, on that budget. So consolidating does seem to us to be a sensible way forward on, on a number of counts. Um, so we're proposing in this report to take our six special schools uh, wonderful special schools and our two pupil referral units and, and to bring them together to amalgamate them into three integrated provisions with our health and care uh, partners so that children get kind of all their needs met. And our two specialist nurseries, well, one but on two sites, we'd like to bring that onto a mainstream nursery site. And instead of offering part-time nursery provision on two days a week, we'd like to offer proper full-time integrated nursery provision on one site specialist but included within a, a mainstream provision full disabled access which we don't have at the moment hence having to have two sites because there isn't disabled access on one of them. Um, the slide after that just says something about the finances. This is in your report in the appendix. It's just showing the kind of spend that we have um, on, on our six special schools, 9.53 million, that's 430 children. It's in, your, it's in the report um, in case anybody wants to follow the detail. I'm just looking for it now. On page um, 23, table 2. That's some, and we think that by consolidating, by pooling budgets more effectively, over a four-year period, we could significantly reduce that cost while still maintaining everything that children have, having a few more places and providing a much better holistic, holistic service. So we've looked at the finances. I say they're not fully worked up proposals like they would be if we go ahead with this, but we're looking at a saving, we think, of a £12.5 million budget of about a million and a half, um, which is definitely going to be reinvested in services for children with special educational needs and disabilities. It's not going anywhere else. It's going to be reinvested in frontline services for children with SEN and disabilities. Um, next, that's just a little, um, it's uh, uh, over the page uh, in the appendix. It's just a little bit what we're proposing, how the current special schools and PRUs uh, would uh, amalgamate into the integrated provision if we go ahead looking in more detail at these proposals. Uh, and the last slide, which we definitely won't be able to see, but is the last page in your report, actually does give an indication of where all these provisions are, because we've also looked at the geography of this, uh, because actually bringing them together in more geographical um, clusters also means that children don't have to travel so far. That's better for them, not sitting in buses and taxis and cars for long periods of time. It's better for them. It's more cost effective for us as a local authority. Um, and we've sort of looked at it on that basis as well. And I think that ends the PowerPoint. So uh, thank you for listening to that.
Thank you very much, Regan. I'll open this up for questions, comments, and debate. And as I say to people, if they can indicate any way they possibly can, other than shouting. I've got one indication from Councillor Baradell. I've got, and I'm going to have to deal with names as well, so it's, it's doubly difficult for me. Um, indication from Amanda Mortensen. Uh, Councillor Brown, Councillor Miller, Councillor Phillips, Councillor Taylor, Councillor Daniel, Councillor McCafferty. And I'll write those down so I don't forget. Councillor Baradell. Thank you, Chair, and um, can I thank the officers for the um, very clear presentation. Um, I appreciate that this is a, a completely separate, but I would argue it's also related to um, Anna Jenkins' deputation and the current staff consultation, because if we're dealing and looking to achieve better outcomes for children with learning um, disabilities, um, SEN, we need to make sure that it's there's, there's not any, um, and this is what I'm seeking assurance on, unintended consequences between the two reviews that are taking place. Um, because one will have a knock-on effect on the other. And if we're after better integration, we need to make sure that, it's, it, it's, that we do see the whole picture as well when we come to making decisions in probably February, March time. I think that's really important. Um, and obviously, I welcome anything we can do that will improve the life chances of, um, of the, this group of children. Um, there's some really positive um, outcomes that are trying to be achieved when we look at 215 and um, the principles, um, the personalization, the integration, the consolidation. For me, though, I'd, as part of, I suppose, you wouldn't want to be doing this piece of work unless this is the route that's gone down, but I would like to see some form of measures um, to make sure that the success, you know, if it happens, it is achievable and, and how we say we have <coughs> achieved this and the young people are saying this and the parents are saying that this has worked and this is better. Um, and the only other thing that grates all the way through the report, and I have asked this, but I'm going to put it on public record, is that the names that are given to the, the three proposals um, are absolutely appalling, and perhaps the young people themselves can, can be part of the, the choice, making the choice of whatever the outcome schools are called, because I think it's really important that the name of the school that you go to, believe it or not, is actually really important, and I think, I think that will really help. Um, and maybe it's part of the consultation. Maybe it doesn't start till after the consultation, but I seek assurances on all of those points. Thank you. Can anyone remember? Oh, I know I can. It was Amanda Mortensen, wasn't it? Hello. Thanks for that. Um, I could ask about 5,000 questions as the parent of a disabled child living in Brighton, but I'm just going to pick out three things. I'd like to know more about the specialist nursery provision. Will this mean more specialist places? How will it work? How will the place for a child at this specialist provision differ from a child going to a mainstream nurse with pre-sense coming in? That's one question. The other question is, this all sounds great in principle, but where will the money come from to make it happen? For instance, at Downsview, where I'm a governor, where my daughter goes, where will the health professionals actually sit? Where will the social workers be? How will children stay on, on site beyond the end of the school day? And my third question was the, the idea about 19 plus provision, which sounds amazing, but what alarmed me which I didn't realize was that my daughter, who has a PMLD, profound and multiple learning difficulty type profile, actually wouldn't really be eligible because she doesn't make educational progress. So I wanted to get assurances that the 19 plus provision would actually provide for children like my daughter at the very, very complex end of the, of the spectrum. And they're my three out of about 500 possible questions. Okay, Regan, shall, we get, shall I get you to answer those points before we move on to the next round? Definitely, and, and colleagues, please jump in because they cross a whole uh, range of things. Um, 
Uh, following, uh, I just want to say to Councillor Bradell, I did actually put that bit in about young people choosing the name of the school. Uh, so, it, no, <laughs> there's been a number of versions, but I did, after our discussion, I did put that in, because that's absolutely right. And we've really struggled with what to say. We didn't want to call them schools, because the concept is much more than a school. Uh, you know, it is a place where all needs are met, and, and so the, the word provision is the best we can come up with. But yes, of course, um, it is a right old mouthful, and, and, and we would definitely want to have good names um, uh, and children involved in that. Um, it, it, measures of success, absolutely. And if we go ahead to work up these proposals, they will be worked up with all stakeholders, parents, young people, and we are going to really want to know what success looks like for families. Uh, it's different and different, uh, with different types of need, um, but we, we want to make sure that it's right and appropriate uh, for all of our kids, so I totally agree with that. Um, uh, um, nursery provision, yes, I mean, uh, we have been looking at that. We do, we do actually have um, an, a nursery provision in a mainstream school for children with speech and language difficulties. Um, and, and so we do have a model here already. Um, I'm not saying that's exactly the model we're using, but we're, we're sort of thinking about um, whether we can use one of our um, really strong nurseries with enough space and, and, and to make that a sort of full to, more full-time provision for our young, young people. That's, that's a, a proposal. Um, the, the, there's no intention to reduce the number of places. To be honest, at the moment, we probably offer just about the right number of places. We don't turn children away, um, as a, and we do want to offer the right number of places. We've broadly got it right, but it differs every year. We're not trying to take any places out, uh, and we do try to meet children's needs um, wherever we can. Um, Yes, where will health professionals sit? Well, that's, that's very much a, a subject of uh, discussion. Um, one thing that probably um, I haven't talked about really is it, because we're looking at consolidating buildings, uh, and there's all kinds of caveats around this, which my colleagues uh, in the capital program tell me asked me really careful to say, and it's absolutely true, uh, that there's caveats about a lot of our buildings, but it's possible that we could reuse and deliberate some of our buildings uh, and and the adaptations that we need to do in our integrated provision to make sure our health colleagues had the provision that they need, the therapy rooms, everything that they would need, and that our care services, you know, our, our youth clubs or activities for children after school or whatever, that they would have what they need. They're, they're predicated on us finding some money to make those adaptations, and we have started looking at how we would how we would do that. But it's not impossible. It, you know, we can see a sort of way in which that uh, might be done. And we have been looking at centering our integrated provision on those sites that have room to do that. And that is some of our, our sites have got, you know, good accommodation and plenty of room to do extra building or adaptations as needed. Yes, I mean, we want a pathway for our young people with education, health and care plans from 0 to 25. Um, the 19 to 25 is being worked out. As you know, it's still relatively new for us. We don't want to leave any child out. Um, but it's complicated considerations, but we're looking at those now. Anyone else want to add anything? Cause, uh... Okay, we'll move on to the next. I think the next people I said, because I was saying it all so quickly, I forget names. Uh, I think I said Councillor Miller and Councillor Phillips as the, ne as the next two. So. Oh, Councillor Brown. Okay, Councillor Brown first, and then we'll move to Councillor Phillips, and then we'll carry on down the line. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Regan, for that really helpful presentation. Um, anything to do with changes to provision for people with SCN and learning disabilities is always sensitive and very worrying for users of the service, and needs to be planned, consulted on, and executed with great sensitivity. Unfortunately, this has not always happened with these proposals. And as has been said, they've got completely mixed up with separate proposals for amalgamating the learning support services that give direct help to pupils in mainstream schools. So I think we all regret this confusion and hope lessons have been learnt for the future. Another concern we have is that although the proposals for the amalgamation of our special schools is fairly detailed, the proposals for merging learning disabilities for children's and adult services is less so. And we would just like assurance that when these proposals are more worked up, 
they will come back to the relevant committees for discussion. Having said all that, we do very much support the proposals being worked up and going out to consultation. The personalized pathways and the proposed integration of services with one-stop shop type provision has to make it easier for families as they have long felt that the provision was too fragmented and difficult to access. Also, anything to ease the transition phase to adulthood has to be welcomed, as in, <clears throat> as in the all-age well-being service to be commissioned by the CCG, which also seems to be the way forward. The proposals for the reorganization of special school provision seems entirely appropriate. Hillside and Downs Park are in the same road, and it makes sense to amalgamate them to cater for the west of the city. In the east, Downs View is already well regarded and can be expanded. To provide integrated central provision for children with social, emotional and mental health needs will mean the council will no longer need to pay out this transitional funding that Regan mentioned because they have too few pupils and this funding can be put to more positive use for our children and young people. These plans should also mean that children will be able to access their schooling nearer to where they live instead of having to crisscross the city. And it will also hopefully lead to reductions in the transport budget. Today, we're only being asked for permission to draw up more detailed proposals before going out to consultation. And we would agree with this. We must ensure though that we hold open and transparent consultation with all stakeholders and then we will look forward to further reports coming to future committee meetings. Thank you. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, and thank you for your um, report, Regan. I think that was really helpful. Um, just before I go into my questions, I just wanted to say for the record, I think that for me certainly, um, having a more detailed report, even if it is only just to a, a agree um, to go out to consultation is, going to, is much more beneficial than having a report that lacks the detail and so we're going to have to be asking a lot of questions about it. So it kind of feels like it's heart, cart before horse here and um, I think that's a real shame. A lot, uh, some of the things in here may be great but for me certainly I find this report too vague. Um, and um, I don't know about the other members of this committee, but it was very, it was received very, very late as well. Um, and some of us have full-time jobs and have to work around that and, and also read papers. So um, I, I would really appreciate it if um, those comments were taken on board so that they could be, um, sorry, do you have something to say? All right. Um, so that they could, that those sorts of things could be rectified in the future. So just going on to my questions now. Um, so the first one was around the nursery provision. And I just wondered whether you could um, explain what other options might have been um, looked at when you came up with uh, 3.2.1. Um, for example, um, nursery provision and integrated school units, had that been looked at? What other options had been looked at so that just so that we've got a clearer idea of why this one has been chosen, I guess. Um, on 3.3.5, um, you know, for us, this, this is basically paving the way for privatisation of learning disability services. Um, and there's, we see it as a lack of democratic accountability. And obviously, being Greens, we don't want any private se sector providers, so we won't be able to agree with that, unfortunately. So that's just a comment. Um, in 5.14.1, um, so this is where it's the same unit for moderate and profound learning difficulties, which obviously would need to be managed carefully to ensure each pupil gets support they need. Um, I just wondered how this was going to be done, um, especially because I would imagine in a unit like that, um, maybe those, those children with more complex needs um, you know, may um, be getting much more of the time of uh, staff and so forth. Um, on 5.15.5, in the reduction of the um, PRU capacity for part-time placements, I just wondered how that will be managed and um, what the mainstream schools thought about that. 
Um, and then in 6.9, under the financial implications, I'm not sure whether you can respond to this bit, um, but I think there's an area of potential concern here because as I'm reading it, basically, um, the way it's reading to me is it's saying that we need approval from the DfE to disapply the minimum funding guarantee that exists within the school's and early years finance regulations. So does that mean we're cutting the budget relative to last year quicker than the regulations say we are allowed to? So I just wanted some clarification on that. And then finally, um, I think this is also what um, Councillor Brown was alluding to in terms of process. Um, and 6.13, um, I'm not clear which committee it will come back to. Will it be this joint committee? Um, and in order to inform plans going to PNR, will there be time for councillors to see proposals before they start informing financial plans? Thank you. Regan, do you want to start answering and then we can pick up the rest? Doing Sorry, my I was best. completely distracted there. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. I think Ellen's going to come in and uh, pick up the issues about the crews. Um, I'm trying to do this in order. I mean, I think this is probably a comment rather than a question, but you, you were talking about it being a bit too vague. Um, I think that, uh, in essence, we've got to a certain point and we feel at this point we need approval to go to the next point. You're always a bit further ahead in your thinking, uh, but actually at this point we need to sort of say, does this look sensible? Because there's no point investing a lot of time in something that isn't the way as a city we want to, to go. Um, so that, that's what I would say to that, but, uh, you know, totally take the comment. Um, uh, we talked about nursery, options for the nursery. We have looked at other options for the nursery because actually creating that inclusive nursery, it's very close to my heart, but it's very, very expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, we have looked at some other options, perhaps affiliating nursery provision in, in, in mainstream schools local to our special schools so that it would be quite easy for them to, uh, you know, sort of support those nurseries. That's, uh, that's another option leaving it as it is, that's another option. But there are some problems, uh, you know, that we've got, it's part-time, it's all at one side of the city, which means quite long journeys. And um, one of our buildings isn't disabled accessible, so we've had to open a, another one for six young people somewhere else. It just seems like we probably, if we started with a blank sheet of paper, we wouldn't have created that. So now's a chance to sort of think, can we do something better um, that would uh, work out a bit better for, for young people? Um, yes, I mean, we, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the private sector and, and all the rest of it. I, I think for us, probably um, the main provider in, um, certainly in children's services, a bit different in adults, is the community and voluntary sector. Um, uh, and they are always quite close to our hearts as well. They provide a lot of services for children's disability. And in some ways, they sometimes provide things that we couldn't easily provide as well. So we do see there's a place for that continuing uh, forward um, and certainly we've been having discussions with them um, about some aspects of, of, of what they could provide in the new integrated um, settings. The merging between schools for children with learning difficulties, well, um, that's something that East and West Sussex have done already. Uh, and I've been, I went to visit Woodlands Mead um, in West Sussex and, and, and you can see again, you know, you've got this thing, there are always pluses and minuses, but you do have this incredible economies of scale, you know, you, you can really make something uh, rather good in a school that caters for all learning difficulties. It's quite difficult to, to do if you break it up. So, but there are, there are pros and cons um, and, and I think we would want to go on a journey there of looking at whether that's uh, really the way forward. I think we are convinced that it probably is, but again, we do really want to talk with all stakeholders about that. Geographically, it certainly makes sense, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. We've got schools pretty well next door to each other, but operating as separate units. Um, Ellen, do you want to say something about the Prus? 
Uh, so I think it's important to just distinguish that the function of a pupil referral unit is actually that we have a revolving door um, and that it isn't, it's distinct from a special school place. So it's one of the ideas is that we use it in terms of its respite function um, to enable some intense work to go on with a young person or child before they're then returned to mainstream. The, the kind of problems we have, and my, my colleagues in the public gallery will testify, that actually if you have a perverse incentive whereby the resource is all tied up in the pupil referral unit, we've had situations where the mainstream school then backs away um, and that revolving door doesn't actually sort of um, exist in, in reality. So um, one of the, the things we've wanted to do through this um, consultation is actually look at ways of if you like, not having such black and white distinctions between what's a, a special school or a pre placement or a mainstream placement, but that we almost build in some fluidity and some collective responsibility in managing children with behaviour problems across the, the whole sort of spectrum from mainstream to, to special. Um, I think the other thing to, to, to say is that in having an integrated provision around behaviour, emotional and social difficulties or social, emotional and mental health difficulties, there is a challenge around having large numbers of pupils in one place. So what we're trying to achieve is the benefits of something that is coherent and joined up, but also allows us to be able to disperse and have as many pathways as possible. And so this is a, a means of bringing our mainstream partners very much on board in terms of offering those, um, those pathways for, for children with challenging behaviour. Um, and then the, I think the last thing, there was some quite complicated questions about um, P&R committee and finances, I think, wasn't it? And, yeah. Do you want to take those, Pinnaki? If, if we maybe get an answer from the officer so that we've covered all of those questions, then I'll let you come back, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Chair. So there was a question related to uh, paragraph 6.9 in the report, which is around the, the fin financial situation. So it is slightly complicated, so please bear with me. Um, we have a mechanism for funding children in special schools, so each child has an allocated amount of money that follows them into the special school, and that's based on historic precedent. And that value is different from authority to authority, dependent on whatever the previous situation was. By reducing the number of um, buildings and using fewer, fewer buildings, that means we make some savings through that process. But that money cannot be, that's not a cut, that has to be reused. So what that means is that the total value that follows the child into the school following that redesign increases. And so when you make a change to the amount of money that you're allocating uh, per child to school. You have to go through a formal process with the DfE. Now, obviously, that process is set up for the exact opposite proposal, which is to reduce the value that's flowing for the child. Actually, what we're doing here is we're increasing the amount of money. So we, we really do not anticipate that there'll be a problem with the Secretary of State for, 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 for doing that, but it is a formal process we've got to do, because this proposal is not about saving money. It's about using the money in a different way. So that, that's that sort of technical, does that make sense? That's a kind of technical response to that. The other question was related to the 5.1. No. 6.13. 6.13. Thank you. And that's uh, proposals coming back to adult. That's the adult proposal. I just wondered if that one might be my colleague Denise D'Souza. It might well be. Let me just have a look at that. There's a. You look as well. Yeah. Can you ask the question again? Thank you. Which committee it would come back to? Would it be this one or a different committee? Um, and if it's to inform plans going to PNR, will there be time? And that's on the 4th of December, I think. Will there be time for councillors to see proposals before they start informing financial plans? So some, some, there, there, there were some proposals that were already agreed to consultation 
to go out to consultation at, at PNR last week. So depending on what we need to do, it will be a case of what needs to come back to the Health and Wellbeing Board. And if it's about resources, it would need to go back to PNR. Thank you. Um, Councillor Miller and then Councillor Taylor. Councillor Yates, I think Councillor Phillips wanted to come back on some of the original Oh, she wanted points. to come back. Okay, fine. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, on the response to 5.14, I suppose my question was about, you know, needs to be managed carefully to ensure each pupil gets the support that they will need. And I know that your re response to that was about, you know, it was done in East and West Sussex and it's about economies of scale and so forth. But I don't really feel that my question about how can we ensure that every pupil will get the support they need regardless of how complex their needs are has been answered. And um, yeah, similarly with the 5.15.5 response, um, I was probably not clear enough in, in what I was saying, so apologies for that, but how will that be managed and what do mainstream schools think about it? You did, you did mention in your response about mainstream schools and, and working together with them, but I want to know what they think about this now. Thanks. Um, I, I think it's, it's important to note that um, this will be a consultation. One of the things that once we get, um, or if we get, um, sort of permission from you, that we would set up a project board that would be a sort of have combined representation from secretary primary heads alongside um, PRU and special school colleagues. So. I, I don't have any sort of, if you, if you like, um, definitive idea. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, if we agree in principle, then, then I'll be asking them how, how they can see that working. I mean, I think one of the things to, to point out that if mainstream colleagues um, were asked, they probably want us to build about 1,500 times bigger PRU. Um, and and so, so, so actually, but, but I think having agreed the principle that that's not going to happen, they are very positive in terms of working with us to, to try and make this work. There was a, a, the other question was about how can we assure every child gets the support they need? I mean, I suppose what I would say to that is I think that is absolutely close to the hearts of everybody who works in the system. We have great leaders of special provision in this city. Um, we have great services and we have a very positive uh, educational experience for our children in special schools. We're not going to step back from that. Um, obviously, we would need to look at other provisions, how they've done it. We'd have to learn from their journeys, what the pitfalls were, what they do differently if they did things again. But in a way, this children's needs are met now. So we would just have to be really, really careful that what they got was something better um, and enhanced. But I, I do accept what you're saying, that there's always, when you make a change, there's room for it to be better or not better. And we just have to make sure it's better. I'd just like to add a point um, and just to remind the committee and the board that what we are asking the committee and the board to do today is to agree to go to a consultation phase. So the proposals here don't have some of the detail because that, that's not what we're, what, what we're seeking decision. We're seeking decision to move into the next phase, which will relate to a consultation. So for each of the schools concerned, there will need to be an individual consultation process around that, which I hopefully will respond to some of the specific points that Councillor Phillips is, is asking. That will have to go through, it's a statutory consultation, it will go through a statutory consultation period. That will then come back uh, in relationship to schools, to the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. And if the committee agrees with whatever the proposal is following that consultation phase, it will then go back out again through a statutory notice period, which is the second formal part of that process. And then that will come back again to the Children, Young People and Schools Committee. So for any of the proposals related to school provision, including the pupil referral units, there will be two <laughs> consultation processes, both of which will need to come back to the committee to make a decision. Thank you. Okay, moving on, I'll take Councillor Miller and Councillor Taylor. Yeah, thank you for that reinsurance, Pinnakey, because that was one of my questions. I didn't quite understand whether we agreeing to a consultation, but there's quite a few recommendations which seem to 
indicate that it may be a fait accompli, but I'm pleased that it is a consultation. Um, I was just wondering if we could have a, a this is a side, side step, but when the next one of these meetings is so that we can put it in our diaries on the corporate calendar, it's not on there. I don't know whether you said it was on an ad hoc basis, but it may be useful so that, um, so that there's less substitutes uh, in future. I found the report quite difficult to read. I mean, it's, it's in a general format, which isn't usually that of the committee. I, I think it's in the health and wellbeing format, um, which, I mean, I, f I found difficult to follow where the recommendation started, where they ended, um, and I, uh, maybe if, if this comes to future committee meetings, it could be set out um, slightly more clearly. Um, I think here that there's been a, a bit of a communications um, issue. Um, I welcome the consolidation because it's from what I can gather from the report, it's better and more services, um, taking money out of back office management and moving it to frontline services with a saving, I think this is correct, of 1.5 million out of the 51 million pound budget. Um, so, it's, so it's not a huge amount of savings, it's about increasing um, frontline services and it, the reorganization appears to be necessary if we're to meet growing pressures and demands on the service. Um, but there does seem to be a, a, a bit of a communications issue as a result of, of Councillor Buick's article, uh, which um, in the paper, uh, where the council were going bust in two years, because um, it appears this, to me, has been potentially slightly rushed, um, and that the, um, the, the first pe the people heard of this was in the paper of reducing um, the number of council-run special schools a special needs schools from six to three. And, and as a result, this, this seems to have followed. Um, and I think that's a key lesson that in future we get our communication and our docs in a row um, before we, we release things in future. Um, now, I have a few questions, um, but that's my general observations. Um, I'd just like to know if um, the report has any positive or negative um, implications on the quantities of, of, or availability of respite care and short breaks because potentially that in the long run could lead to um, more costings. Um, on page 9 uh, at 3.1.1, uh, it says that there's no overall reduction in number of school places, and this has slightly been covered by Regan already, no overall reduction in the number of school places, but I'm just checking that those school places were the right type of school places in the right places, because if, we're, um, if the provision um, doesn't match the need, um, then, then there may be an issue for, for parents and children. Um, on page 10 at 3.2.3, um, talks about the integrated nursery provision, this is also slightly being covered. I'm just wondering where that would be, because it doesn't appear to be on the existing two sites. Um, on, I'm just pausing, so I can take a note. Um, on 3.3.32, um, I was just wondering whether the scrutin this scrutiny pa panel's recommendations to see where the gaps are in autistic children's um, whether, where, where they are in this report or whether they're coming to a later report, because in the updated GSNA, it doesn't say uh, what that is or whether it's in another document. I'm just wondering what's happened to that. Um, in 3.3.4.1, um, 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 I was just wondering how the facilitation of transition from children to adult services, that's going to link to the... Um, post-16 education review that I understand is undergoing um, at the moment and how that's going to link together. Um, sorry about this. I've quite a few questions. It's quite an important topic. Um, well, a very important topic. Um, on page 12, the resource allocation system and the changes to that more equitable and fair allocation. I'm just wondering what happens to the losers out of that because there's, there's bound to be losers and how do we ensure that there's a smooth transition as a result of that change in resource allocation? Um, page 14, this is, and this is a point for um, reports in general. They seem to be open-ended um, data in, um, sort of assumptions. This is a 12% increase in numbers of people. And, the, and in reports, there's, there's never footnotes. And I just wonder where these figures come from or whether they're from um, the current projections or whether they're from census data or where, where these actually come from because we need to understand as, as members to scrutinise where, where those figures come from. Um, and then, getting to the end. Um, if, if, if I can just intervene yeah, at this point, sure. can, I, can I just remind councillors and members and co-optees and people of all assorted opportunities for speaking, 
3.1.2 makes it very clear. This is approval to draw up detailed proposals in relation to all of these ideas. This isn't saying that there are detailed proposals drawn up already for these ideas. We need to be very clear. This is about a direction of travel for the delivery of services, and it's giving as much detail as is available at the moment. There are two ways of doing a consultation. Like I said at the start, we could bring it to this committee... And it goes off in any, uh, any direction possible, or we could keep reflecting time and time again that what is going on, where the progress is. This is a progress report on an item that this joint, this joint committee and board requested to be undertaken. The officers have brought back progress so far. It, I think it's an excellent point at which to be bringing back progress so far, but it's not fair to be asking the, asking the officers detailed questions. If they had detailed answers, they would be in the report. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just continue asking my questions, and if, answers, if uh, officers can't answer them, let them please just say, I don't know yet, it will be part of the later review, that's fine with me. Um, um, I just, but also, it's not just us that may want to know, it's members of the public that might not, like to know that answer as well, and, and it's important for them to know that answer isn't yet being dealt with. Um, on page 17, um, 5.141, um, I was just wondering whether there are any downs downsides of this aggregate, aggregate, aggregated provision, because I can think of one, maybe potential institutionalization and things like that, but I was just wondering, obviously that might be set out in later reports as well. Um, and page 19, um, I would also like to see potentially, and this is a point that Councillor Norman made at the PNR report at the committee meeting the other day, whether the consultation will come before um, members beforehand. Well, you can ask that as well, so I can. Um, and page 20, 6.12, it says that the balance of receipts after the initial ring fence ring fencing will be used to support the Council of Future Corporate Capital Strategy. I just want to ensure and get some assurances that when we sell the, the capital assets as a result of, of these, these mergers, that we're not going to um, potentially look, look at those later on as something we can poach the money from, but these new schools are going to get all the services that they need and any ring fencing money, ring fence money left will, will come back, but we're not going to particularly be um, under, underspending on the new schools to ensure that we um, sort of reinforce our capital budgets. And, um, that's it. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Does, does, does answer my questions first before Councillor Are we? Oh. We haven't before, but okay, that's fine. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just respect to the, um, and with the greatest of respect to the Chair's comments and to Councillor Miller about the recommendation in the report, I would just like to say that there has actually, in the public domain, I don't think um, what we are talking about here in the report has been entirely clear to members of the public and I think the fact that there are so many people in the public gallery uh, is a testament to that uh, misunderstanding and I think part of that um, I'm afraid to lay blame at any particular person's door but you know comments in the local media haven't helped avoid that kind of confusion and I think you know that really does lay with the feet of the administration on this one um, I'll go on. I don't have any questions because they've all been uh, covered Sorry. extensively. <laughs> <laughs> that, Everyone's that, that, that's all covered. right. It might come as a relief, actually, but uh, to officers. But um, I would just like to echo, of course, I agree with the comments that Councillor Brown has made and Councillor Miller as well. Uh, with the principles of integration of services is in accordance with national policy. And I know the government is certainly very clear that we do make sure these services are delivered more seamlessly to the benefit of uh, service users. I also note in the report that there is an awareness that our services as a city are continuing to be at a high cost uh, than our comparator councils. But I'm also pleased to see that in the report uh, that the council is looking at ways to uh, minimise this. 
Um, I am also pleased that um, Regan, uh, Regan Delft's presentation trying to provide better services and I think that has to be the key uh, consideration for all of us here, that it is the outcomes that matter. It isn't the processes of how services are delivered. It is the outcomes. And I really want to hammer home that point. Um, I think many other people in the committee and the public are as well have been completely shocked at the level, the neat figures for children and young adults with SEN. I wasn't aware of that figure and I have to say it did really surprise me. I don't think young people, young adults even with SEN should suffer any disadvantage compared to anyone else and they should have exactly the same opportunities and I'm pleased that um, the council is starting to address that issue. As I say, the, uh, my question uh, has already been, uh, my, one of my main questions was taken by Councillor Phillips, but I would certainly like to echo her concern that it hasn't been made entirely clear uh, which department or which uh, committee is going to have monitoring and oversight of these proposals as we move forward. I think these are uh, very important proposals. This is a very important issue, and we have to make sure that this doesn't fall between two or three uh, stools. Um, but I do note that there already has been comments on that, and it has already been answered. So I'd like to bring my comments to a close. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think Pinnock is going to deal with the committee question and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the more detailed answers, if there are any. Thank you, Chair. I will leave the detailed answers to Regan and her team over, over the other end of the room. Um, in relationship to the committees, just want to reassure uh, members, uh, particularly members, I guess, on this side of the room, that um, pr any proposals that relate to uh, redesign or changes, amalgamation, closure of schools, all of those um, decisions would need to come back to the Children and People and Skills Committee. So, as I said before, what this um, report is seeking to do is to get permission to consult, which is the statutory consultation on the next phase in relationship to that school-based provision, um, and that the results of this consultation would need to come back to the Children and People and Skills Committee uh, to decide whether they want to then take that into the next phase, which is a statutory notice that will then again come back to the Children, Young People and Skills Committee for a final decision. So there's quite a long process for those. Uh, and so you will see uh, more detailed alliterations of these proposals through that process. Okay, um, that's quite a, a range of questions. So we're gonna take it in turns to answer some of them. And Jenny's going to start off talking a little bit about uh, the question that was about, is there any negative impact uh, potentially from proposals in relation to respite care. Hello, yes, yeah, so the, I mean the, the starting point is that there is no planned or actual reduction in the available budget for short breaks for disabled children and young people. Um, there is a commitment to where families are asking for it to providing a personalised approach and to the delivery of direct payments um, one of the things we're trying to prioritise is how we support families who want direct payments to identify workers and um, deal with the complexities that go with employing people. So there's, there's no reduction, though, in the short break capacity that will be available in the city. Um, and just tied in with that, you asked about the question of the resource allocation system and the winners and losers issue. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're very committed to is creating greater fairness in the city in terms of how we share the resources that are available for short breaks for families. Um, and that's why we're very committed to the benefits of having a more scientific approach. That's the, the phrase I'm going to use for how we decide which families get resources. Um, but what we're very clear about is that the resource allocation tool that we're planning to use is a tool that's been used in adult services, so to a degree it's been tried and tested, um, but it will sit alongside a professional assessment of that child and family's needs. So it, it's something that we're seeing as a, a very useful addition to the processes we currently use that will create greater transparency and fairness. Just ask um, Cameron to talk a little bit from the adult social care because I think the question was really about if we look at resource allocation across the 
the peace, adults and children, could there be losers on one side or the, or the other? So how you would deal with, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, um, I mean, obviously it's, it's a tool that adult services have now used for some years to deliver personal budgets. As Jenny says, it's about an equitable um, apportioning of resources according to the assessment of need, but it is a tool. It doesn't divorce our responsibility and duties uh, to meet people's assessed needs. And so uh, certainly in adult services, it's quite a dynamic tool. So on occasion, we do happen to vary that resource allocation system to deliver different budgets for different people. Sometimes we vary the actual budget accordingly. Sometimes that's up and sometimes that's down. Um, and then we use that to learn to refine the tool further to try and in improve its accuracy. But it's not something that you know, that whatever the tool derives, you have to have and work with. It's about, again, as Jenny said, it's about being more transparent about how we're apportioning those resources um, and then working with the person to try and meet their needs and deliver that in a way that they want that is, you know, using that personal budget as an indicative amount. And I'll, I'll pick up the, um, uh, the other questions. Um, which what about do we get the right kind of school places? Um, there's, a, there's a dark art here of uh, working out exactly what we need because it's never the same two years running. So, so we commission our places annually and we do a deal with the Department for Education because they part fund, we fund the top, what's called the top art, very complicated business. Um, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, we get it pretty right most years. Obviously, you never know a child can move in or move out of the city and think that things change. But yes, it, it is a dynamic process. It changes every year. Uh, and one of the reasons I think we're reviewing at the moment now is that needs have changed a bit. Um, you know, I often use the example of autistic spectrum condition. That was once something that was pretty rare when I started out, albeit you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth kind of thing. But when I started out, autism was something you didn't come across very often. Uh, and now, if you look at our statements or education, health and care plans, it's our most prevalent category, main category of, of need. So the world's changed. It, children may have changed. The way we diagnose and think about their conditions may have changed as well. Um, it's a great debating point. But the reality is we have to move to match the needs as identified uh, with our young people, and we do do that. Where will the nursery be? $60,000 question. We've looked at some different sites. They've got pluses and uh, minuses. We need to do some more work on it. The costs, the adaptations, etc., are really, really key. So I can't give you an answer at, at the moment. Um, Children with autism, very close to our hearts. So all our special schools take children with autism uh, and do, I think, a fantastic job. We don't have a school for children with autism in the city specifically, but all of our schools, I think, do a great job in different ways for children with autism, slightly different approaches. So it gives parents a bit of choice about might that what they might want. Um, post-16 education, are we linked into the review? Yes. Um, and we've been doing quite a bit of talking already with City College, with some of our special schools about, about provision post-19 um, and post-16. Um, and where do we get our data from? Well, there's different sources, uh, but mainly it's the, what are called the statistical releases that come from the department, uh, section 251, for anybody who really wants to get down with all the tables, um, but you can look at local authorities against each other across a wide range of indices. Um, uh, and I'm sure adult social care probably have other sources uh, that I may not yet be overly familiar with. But you're absolutely right, we should quote it, and I, I really take that comment to heart. I try to remember to do that, but I don't always, always do that. And I think it's a really good point because statistics can be used to all over the place, can't they? And we really should say, so you can check us up that we're right. Okay, I've got an indication for Denise D'Souza that she wishes to speak. Just to let people know where we are in terms of, in terms of names on the list, I've got Councillor Daniel, Councillor McCafferty, uh, Francis McCabe, Martin Jones, Ben Glazebrook, uh, Reuben, Brett, and then Councillor Buick. 
And I think at that point we may well stop and, and move towards a vote. Because, oh, Councillor Norman as well wishes to speak. Okay, Councillor Norman, you're on the list. I had a lot from, the, from this side of the table. So, and, uh, so Councillor Daniel. Oh, sorry, Denise. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm not, not going to vote, but I thought I could speak. Um, just a couple of bits. Um, just in terms of 5.1 and, and in terms of the estimation, unfortunately, whilst we, we try and predict um, our growth across a range of client groups, this is probably one area where it is easier to, to predict because of, obviously, it's children coming through transition. So that one will be based on what we know in, in terms of some of the data. But I also take your point on that. The other question was also around and the consultation questions, they are currently being put together and they w we have made a, 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 a commitment to share those with both um, policy and resources members and also health and wellbeing board members. If, it, if, you, if you need to, if you want to. Any reason why We're happy to share with whoever wants to see them. <laughs> okay, progressing then, Councillor Daniel and then Councillor McCafferty this round. Okay, so first of all, I think it's um, what I want to say is for years people have said, why, why does everyone do everything in isolation? Why do, why do we, different parts of the council don't talk to each other, let alone the idea of getting health in the room, getting people around the child, around the family. And so whilst I know this is quite a difficult um, process to go through, I think it's really positive and I think it's, it's genuinely um, local government and partnerships maturing and that we're, at, you know, I think this is, in spite of um, the anxiety any change causes, I think most people are, are meeting this with relative optimism um, and I'm not um, discounting um, those anxieties, nor am I discounting um, the learning that we need to do around communication. Um, but on the whole, I feel quite buoyant about the way that this is being done together and bringing, you know, health, education, social care around the child or family is absolutely the right thing to do. And, and well done to everyone who's made that happen. Um, from the vision and things. I really welcome the importance of supporting family life as well as school attendance and school life. So I just wondered if there was any comments on that. And then um, to echo Councillor Taylor's points around needs um, children with disabilities who are, are not in education, employment or any training. Um, we, we were all really staggered by that, I think. And I wondered how if you could just put it into simple terms, how you think this change is going to change that outcome. Thank you. Councillor McCafferty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, for me, some of the, um, the issue of the logic here um, has gone a bit skew with, I'm afraid. Um, there's historically been anxiety about transition, but then it, it seems completely counterintuitive for me to then merge adults with children and young people and the challenge obviously is that the support for both children and adults uh, the rationale for both is completely different not least because they're based on different statutes um, and although the rationale for the new plan will be uh, from the cradle to the age of 25 what we're actually talking about is a merger beyond the age of 25 as well um, so the provision made for children is generally better, I think uh, most people in the field would um, admit. But then by completely merging uh, both allocation systems, are we by default then saying that certain children are going to get a poorer deal or that certain adults are going to get a better one? I, I, I'm not sure that I want to say either, um, but I, I, I would point out that this, this is exactly why I think some of the aspects of the proposals haven't being thought through to this to this level, I fully accept uh, your previous point, Chair. Um, but I, I, I think, in terms of ensuring that future needs are met fairly, what we have to make sure of is that um, any merger that's proposed from this body today doesn't disproportionately affect adults. Uh, many of you will know that today figures came out from Scope: adults with disabilities, half of them can't get the social care that they need to live independently. One in three expect care to get worse in the next five years, and it goes on and it goes on. Uh, and my argument would be as we go forward, um, 
without wanting to pit one against the other, and, and I am here as a representative from the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, it is my challenge to all of us that actually, uh, through any proposed merger, that, that we still have to talk about the over 25s as well. Um, that, 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 that's a considerable anxiety of mine. I, I'm just wondering if there are uh, they may be very far away from hard uh, proposals, but I'm just wondering if I can get any feeling from the room, either from the Director of Children's Services or indeed Denise or Tom, in terms of what way we're going to provide, what way we're going to entail provision uh, that the over 25s, as it were, aren't forgotten as we go through the process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask Pinnocky, as he's leaning forward, to answer first. So I'm guessing that means he has something to say, and then pass over to Denise and then we'll take the rest of the questions. Thank you, Chair. So just picking up the very specific point, um, the last point. So we currently have a, um, a social care team that works with children, young people, and we have a social care team that works with adults, and we have a social care team that works with the transition from children or young people to adults. So that is three separate arrangements and potential breakpoints for the lives of those young people and those young adults as they move through the system. So I, th I think, as Regan said earlier on in the presentation, there's absolutely a recognition that the needs of, of people as, at different ages are different, but what we are looking to, to develop is something which is a much smoother process without those potential breakpoints uh, for children, young people, young adults, older adults. So that, that's the intention behind, behind the proposal. Uh, Denise might want to add to that. Um, just to add to that, I think the paper talks about exploring them because I think, as Reagan also said quite earlier on, I think there is something about those, there's always, you know, what, where, where is the best place to put this? Because actually we have a lot of older people as well now because people are living longer and their, sometimes their needs are best met within older people services. So I think the, the, the jury is out and we, we're going to have to need to, to continue to explore those. And just in, I think in terms of the, um, in terms of, you talked about the, the, the resource allocation system as well. I think in terms of a meeting need, and you asked a good, the direct question, we, however we have a resource allocation system, and again, I don't think it's about a merging of a resource allocation, it's about children's services looking to adopt a resource allocation system. Under the CARE Act, we have a duty to meet assess need, and that will always be there. Um, and as Cameron eloquently put a little while ago, the resource allocation is an indicative budget. Um, we have to make sure that meets needs, so I hope that provides some reassurance on that. Uh, in terms of the, the comments around um, school life and attendance and as well as the, the NEAT statistics, um, what I'd, I'd want to say is, is um, and I don't want to be trite because I know that um, changes can be very um, difficult and I think there will be anxiety, but actually I also think that there is the huge opportunities um, that, that, this op that this paper presents in terms of us looking across the piece uh, to be more creative, to um, have more vocational pathways, because the neat statistics are largely around um, our children, young people with behaviour, emotional and social difficulties, or with mental health difficulties. Um, and I think what we need to be looking at is, is actually how do we make the curriculum more dynamic, more exciting, and more responsive to, to the changing needs of the employment market. Um, and I think this gives us the opportunity to, to take a step back and look at how we do that in a really sort of systematic way um, across our provisions. But, um, but also I, I, I think as well that we are really keen that education is such a protective factor for um, children and young people around all sorts of um, things to do with antisocial behaviour, child sexual exploitation, uh, radicalisation, uh, and actually really sort of capturing and, and securing their safeguarding that um, we, we need to be really making sure that, that, that children and young people are drawn to the offer and that it improves their life chances. So, um, so yeah, I, I've, I think this is a huge opportunity to try and get that right and improve it further. Okay, I'm just looking to see whether, Regan, did you have any further answers? Yeah, um, I think in, uh, there, was a, there was a comment about transition and whole life pathways, and I hope I've got it I've got it right. Um, 
in, in responding. Um, clearly, we've got legislation that's new about 0 to 25. Um, and do we want to create another great anxiety point for families at 25, or, or do we try to try and make this a smooth pathway, a sort of whole life pathway. That's what we need to consider, really. I could only go back to saying that when we did the initial consultation, we had lots and lots of families. Um, in fact, even when we had our SEN strategy, I think about that consultation, the consultation about the SEN review, what stands out in my mind is the sheer number of responses that we get around transition uh, and the huge anxiety that parents have about that. Um, and their anxieties are about, I, I think, a, a maze, call it. I think they have their booklet's called Through the Next Maze. <laughs> and I think for parents it does feel like Through the Next Maze because then you're entering the whole world of adult services and people get really scared of it. I remember a young person in the consultation saying, it's just so frightening, this, this, this pathway. And I think really we do have to respond to that. Um, because it, we've, we've created something that is a little bit of a nightmare for parents. We didn't mean to, but it is. And, and since we've started looking at the 0 25 pathway, I think in children's services, we've discovered it's much more complicated than we ever thought. For the vast majority of our children, we used to let go at 16 and only take a small number through to 18 because they went off to further education college and that was the end of it. Now we've actually got to see them through we're constantly trying to negotiate and understand why some services start here and stop there and, and to try and uh, sort that out for ourselves. So I, I, feel, I feel that is something that's really important. That and mental health, there's two things that stand out in my mind which were big concerns for parents. Um, and and I, I really think we need to respond to it. Whether we're going to respond to it in the right way, I don't know. But I, I do think it's an important area to consult further on because it is really important to our our families that we, we get this right. Whether it should be a whole life pathway, well, that's something we need to consult on as well, isn't it? Because there's gains and losses. And I think people feel different depending on what age they are as well. The nearer you are to transition points, the more important it is to you uh, that, we get that, that we get that right. So I hope I have sort of answered um, there. Um, and I think uh, Denise picked up the resource allocation Point, unless we mm. want to say any more about that. So I think that's all I've got written down. Okay. Moving on then, I'm, I'm aware that, that we need to you know, perhaps be a little bit brief, but we do need to demonstrate that we are exploring all of these, all of these issues. You need to use... So I just want to um, come back on Feeling's point, which I absolutely fully support. I know this paper really does you know, focus more on children and transition to 25, and that's, that's absolutely correct, and people do need to go through that process from baby to adulthood. Uh, but just to reassure people that we know that there are a lot of people that are over 25 that are probably thinking, how does this impact on me? And I have reassurance from Regan and the team that there is going to be more work involved in that. But also to point people to 5.3 to 5.5, um, there, there has been a review of learning disability in adult services already. Um, it's called A Good, Happy and Healthy Life. And that will be worked alongside with the direction of travel in adult social care that was agreed at the last Health and Wellbeing Board. So by no means does it mean that we're not, you know, focusing on adults 25 and um, including older people. They're very much part of this whole process. Thank you. Okay, moving on then, I'll call Francis McKay from Healthwatch, Martin Jones after that. Um, th there's an enormous amount of work in here, and I can see the devil's in the detail from, the, uh, from all the questions. Mm -hmm. A couple of comments and maybe a question. Um, it, it seems to me that um, there's a lot of um, reference to in this paper and elsewhere about personalised care, personalised cares, budgets, the resource, resource allocation tool obviously relates to this and um, how, um, uh, and, and it, it seems in the next iteration, bearing in mind that this is just a, the start of a process, um, developing that model of personalised care and the menu and how that might work for uh, people who use the service and the parents and carers seems to be a, a crucial element in the detail because that might um, 
answer some of the questions and concerns that are, are going around um, if that's done. Um, the other thing is I feel related to that. Um, this is the, the paper is very educational and I don't really hear the voice around health and well-being very much. It has been men mental health has been mentioned a couple of times, but there's general health as well and just the general well-being. And in the next um, iteration, the, a more holistic approach, um, I think, would be appreciated by me because it feel, feels very much uh, focused on the educational uh, side of things. There was a reference earlier to... Um, using um, independent sectors and the, um, the voluntary sector and maybe the private sector. And um, Reagan was very um, uh, positive about the voluntary sector. And I, um, just um, a plea to make sure that the voluntary sector is supported over, over the next period of time um, to be able to be in the position to be able to work with the local authority to develop new services um, because I think that they do offer some uh, imaginative and creative services in some places that really do complement, you know, the core services provided through the local authority and health services. And the third thing is I'm still not clear about the money. I don't want to hop on about it, but it seems to be some savings to be made, but some other money is going to be definitely reinvested back into the service. So when, whenever something comes back the next time, um, I would like to see it clearer exactly what that means. Okay, Martin. Um, hello there. Um, thank you, Reagan, for this report. Um, obviously, a lot of work's gone into it, and, you know, as direction of travel, it seems that it would have been a great idea, even, you know, we're, we're looking at budget constraints at the moment, but to be honest, this may have been a good four or five years ago, six years ago, whenever this need was first seen. Um, so that's good work. I was going to ask a couple of questions, obviously, for parent governors and, 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 and for, for the parents at the schools. Obviously, there's a consultation uh, system going in, but more about communication outside that consultation, because sometimes uh, a blank, you know, a, a sudden letter or full consultation without a little bit of pre-direction and understanding of what's being considered um, doesn't really help there. Um, and again, because um, particularly these services, even proposal uh, period, etc., that parents should be involved very much in that because these are end users. Um, so very much important that, that, that they're involved very early on on this to make this work well. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing I was going to ask um, was also if, um, for instance, on, the, on transport and things like that, what sort of consideration there would be for, for that? Because obviously your local school is always the, the best school, it, it, hopefully, but there may be, there may be uh, students in Port Slade who feel that they're better provided for in in the East Hub or whatever, or whatever it becomes called, um, and that it's important for, for parents and disabled children to have some sort of uh, choice, just as every other child does. Um, and obviously, if, if transport is, is, is uh, pegged back on for them, then, you know, socio-economic group, how it affects them in relation to the, the other parents who can actually drive the, their kids over, so that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, is, is very much, it, it's great actually, 6.15, you've got equalities implications in the report. Um, and I note that you say that, relate, that they'll be drawn up in relation to all proposals. So that would be even things that you aren't looking, for, that actually don't finally meet the hurdle. Um, but it, it would be important obviously to, to, to look throughout the value for money aspect, but understanding that value for money can mean spending more money if there you know, a greater equality is achieved. And, and that's what we're all striving for, and you're certainly striving for. Um, so if, if we can make sure of that, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and say that it's a 26-page report, and we're talking about an equality group, and we've got three lines. 
So it, it is nice normally when you have a report to see throughout that the, the, the justification and the reason for the report is, yes, value for money, but also to improve equality and, and, and how this will improve equality and improve outcomes. So, it, 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 you know, I'm, I'm being a bit, you know, a bit picky on that, but I just think it's useful. And also, finally, on the equality thing, this is important because the LSS uh, thing has been brought up today. Um, what we need to understand for this, uh, this group is that there are other things going on that can implement as well. So we need to almost joint up a quality assessment. So you've got cumulative effects. And what I mean by that is that this looks wonderful. And if you've got something going on at LSS where there's less, um, less intervention in schools, which is a possible danger. Can I just so, remind people that this is a meeting to discuss this proposal? I know, but, but this, is this is about cumulative equality effects. So I'm saying if, 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 you make this, if you make this one, you know, this looks like a great proposal, you must make sure that the proposals are as good in mainstream. Otherwise, there's a danger that children, instead of going up the ladder and going from special school to mainstream, are forced from mainstream into special school. Sorry, can I, can I just remind people we've got, we, we do have to... No, I'm, ask, I'm, asking point, question. So. I'm asking a question whether, whether, whether there'd, there'd be some sort of joined up thinking on that so that that didn't occur. Thank you. Um, I'll just address the point around health and well-being. Um, a really good point. I think what flows throughout this report is about looking at the needs of children and young people in a holistic way and as part of family units. So we are committed. We've been working with the local authority um, on drawing up these proposals. We've been consulted kind of every step of the way as a CCG and as a health system. And we will continue to be really heavily involved. And it looks at the whole range of provision from mental health through to physical health, support, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, the whole range of therapies that at the moment are delivered in a quite a fragmented way in different sites across the city. And as Regan's already said earlier, one of the things that children and young people and families say very strongly is that they don't want that to continue, that kind of fragmented delivery of services. So we will work across that whole range of kind of health provision in joining that up and making that more integrated. So it's an integrated offer to children and young people where they are, where they spend most of their time, which is usually at school. But we're also committed as, as a CCG to not just focus on those children that have the most complex needs, but to make sure as a system that there's some balance, that we really focus on prevention and being proactive in how we manage health needs, particularly mental health needs, so that the whole system is connected and there's a range of provision across a, a, lot, a spectrum of needs. Yes, yeah, so the question in relation to personalisation. I mean, obviously, it's a complex area because we've got a range of in-house services and a range of commission services with the community and voluntary sector. But the overall direction of travel is one of personalisation, as is a central theme that's come through in the presentation and report. And what we want to do is improve choice and control and give that choice and control to families. Um, and through the development of the RAS, the resource allocation system, we're looking to, uh, to where we want to get to is a situation where families have an individual budget and they can then take control and choose the services that best fit their child and family's needs. And there's a piece of work going on with our procurement and contracting services within the council to look at how we develop the market so that we can maximise the services that are available children and families in Brighton and Hove.
Um, yes, I, I just wanted to pick up um, about the voluntary um, community and voluntary sector, just to say that I do actually think we have a really strong relationship with our community and voluntary sector here, and we have some amazing um, partnerships and, and services provided by Amaze and Bernardo's and, uh, you know, I work with the Parent Carers Council. I mean, I could go on. Um, I think it is a strength <laughs> of, what, of what we do, uh, and we are really committed to working with the community and voluntary sector to develop our, our provision. We see a really central place for it uh, as, as, as we go forward. Uh, so I just wanted to make that really clear. Um, just moving on to, uh, and I suppose uh, I would say that, that um, uh, Martin, you raised about consultation with parents. I think that's really another, I mean, I know that we may sometimes get it wrong, but I do also feel that is a strength in this city. Uh, that we do have. If I just think, you know, the, the times that I've been talking to parent groups lately about different things, different aspects, we've got a PAC Connect coming up in relation to these and, and other proposals. I do actually feel that's something we could always do better, um, uh, but I think it's something we do really well as a city, and, and we are committed to do that going forward. Um, the issue about transport, uh, yeah, I mean, that is a, a work in progress. I mean, really, I think going back to what Jenny was saying about personal budgets, I think what we need to do is obviously we want families to have choice and we want children to go to the best provision for, for them. Uh, but if we have an absolute cat's cradle of taxis going across the city, it's going to cost us a fortune. So it's getting that balance right, isn't it? And also looking at other ways. I think you mentioned, you know, just a sort of easy idea, you know, could we perhaps provide funding for parents to take there and a couple of other, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that we could do this uh, that would enable choice, and, but at a price we could afford. And I think we need to go forward and look how personal budgets can help us do that. It's scary for parents and it's scary for us too. But I think if we do some judicious piloting here, we, we might be able to get somewhere. And I think you made an, a really good point about uh, equalities impact assessments and the point at which we do them and the fact that they link up. And uh, I think I can say is that that's work that we've got to do um, as yet, um, because obviously at the moment we're just seeking approval to work up some proposals, etc. But I, I definitely take the point, and I think it's well made from my point of view. Okay, I've got one more round of questions to go, and then I'm going to ask Councillor Buick just to, just to sum up, as he indicated as well. So I'm going to take Ben Glazebrook and Councillor Norman. Sorry, I was breaking my own rule of speaking into the mic then. Oh, and Reuben as well. And, sorry, as a three, yes. But briefly, please, people. Yep. No, it'd be very brief. Um, I'm sure it will come as no surprise that the community voluntary sector welcomed the mention twice about um, exploring how we can... Um, work with you to support this um, and just to kind of emphasize that, that to explore um, ideas and solutions is, is something that we'd welcome but also um, it's important to note that some of the CVS orgs are working within um, SEND services and provision they're currently being recommissioned um, and it's just um, key to hang on to the challenge there of the capacity within the sector to be able to support the work that's in here so that's it. Thank you. Councillor Norman? Sorry, when I said brief, Councillor Norman, I didn't mean you, obviously. I know that you're always absolute and to the point. Sure you didn't mean me, Chair. <laughs> Chair, and, um, Chair the, the transition period um, has been looked at for some while in this Council, as, as many of us will know. And we all know that changes for the better in services takes time to work up, consult on, and finally, with approval, implement. Now, when it gets to the implementation stage, we must always monitor the newly implemented service to make sure that we continue to improve, and I'm sure that will happen. We must never be complacent. We must never, we, sorry, we must always look for the improvement, however small that may be. Now, regarding the better value for our, our money whilst improving services is surely to be welcomed. Some people and members appear to be, believe that doing things in a different way means the council loses control of those services. I'm certain that this is not the case and the council will continue to oversee the service provision when it's been approved. You'll be pleased I've got no questions. 
We know, we know, Chair, that the detail is still to come, a lot of detail is still to come, but I'm sure that we will continue to be kept informed of such detail. And I'm also sure that the, we have the expertise in the Council to move this forward, so we are happy to support all of the recommendations on this report. Thank you, Councillor Norman. From the voice of experience to the voice of youth, Reuben Brett. Um, can we just have some reassurance that in the consultation process, um, the young people who are affected by the services, who use the services, um, will be consulted um, in the early stages and going right through the consultation, um, and that they'll actually be listened to? I'll take that one. Um, you have my absolute assurance on that. Um, we, we've had a governance uh, board for the special educational needs uh, and disabilities review so far, which does actually have two young people on it. Um, and, and we have um, made opportunities to talk with uh, youth council, uh, a HA group, etc. But we do need to reach out. And I think it's a really, really good point because uh, this covers such a wide range of young people and such a wide range of needs. One of the areas where we sometimes find it a little bit more, more difficult to uh, make contact with both parents and young people is, is young people who've got social, emotional and mental health difficulties, especially behavioral difficulties and needs. We need to be really clear that we get their views as well about what kind of a curriculum uh, they need. So I think it's a really, really good point. It's sometimes easier for us to make those relationships with parents um, because it's easier for them to get to us and, you know, the, et cetera. And we really need to make the effort, but I think it's a good point and we'll definitely do it. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Buick. Thank you, Chair. Um, in summing up, I'll be as brief as possible, not least because um, it's getting very, very close to um, the bed and bar time routine of my three primary age school children. And for those parents in the room, you all know that you never miss out on bed and bar time routines. So um, thank you. In terms of the contributions, can I just thank all members and co-opted members? I think this has been a very uh, informed um, debate that we've had about uh, a set of proposals that we're shortly about to vote on in terms of going through to the next stage of statutory consultation. But can I just, um, cause it, well, I think it would be uh, remiss of us in this setting not to put on record actually the administration's uh, thanks to Regan and her team. She's worked incredibly hard on these proposals over a very long period of time. And I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that, you know, the last uh, two or three weeks in particular have been a very challenging time for all of us at the Council. And picking up on Councillor Brown's comments about lessons learned, I think we'd all reflect and want to reflect on uh, some of the communications challenges that we face uh, in this area. There are a lot of reviews going on. There are a lot of reforms going through. Um, some of them are of our making, others are in a sense a challenge that exists out there that we have to um, deal with. But what I would also want to say, I think, in this public forum, given that we have heard from uh, members of the public who rightly have expressed uh, uh, concerns and anxiety, is I would ask those, uh, again, who are campaigning out in the community to be as responsible as possible when they uh, you know, do meet with parents of children with special educational needs. I mean, I've spent the last week in various radio and TV studios listening to some of these parents who have called in, and they've used words like the council is devastating special educational needs provision because they've been told that that's what the council plans to do. But I think what you've heard from the proposals in front of us um, this afternoon is that this is about transforming and modernizing the way in which we support uh, some of the most important and vulnerable people in our society. And I believe that any society that um, purports to be in a progressive society judges itself by the way in which it supports the most vulnerable people uh, in our community. And that's precisely what these proposals, in terms of their guiding principles, are about. So in summary, this is a set of proposals to move to consultation on personalization of our services, the integration of our services so that families feel they're empowered and they can get the right support in a timely manner. And yes, there is you know, some savings associated with, with this as part of the consolidation of resources, but I would remind members of the Joint Committee that we spend £42 million 
on special educational needs uh, provision in the city. The proposal is that £1.5 million or so will be uh, the main saving, that this has nothing to do with the uh, difficult austerity cuts that we're dealing with elsewhere in local government. This is about being able to reinvest in what I've called those world-class specialist educational facilities, which I think all of us in this committee would wish to see. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I, I certainly think that we've given this sufficient opportunity, so I'm just going to pass over to the legal officer to explain the voting system. <laughs> Are you paying attention? <laughs> uh, it is a complicated set of recommendations because it's a complicated constitutional position. What we have tried to do, though, is bunch the recommendations into themes. So Children, Young People and Skills Committee, councillors and voting co-optees can vote on the recommendations that relate purely to, to education, and those are with the prefix 3.1. So 3.11, 3.12 and 3.13, that's councillors and voting co-optees on the Children and Young People and Skills Committee. On that committee, it will be councillors only in relation to recommendations with the prefix 3.2, which you will recall relates to integrated provision for young people and councillors only for recommendations with the prefix 3.3, and that relates to the recommendations relating to uh, potential review of merger of uh, children's services and adult social care, various policies and elements there. So that's the situation with the Children and Young People Skills Committee, 3.1, councillors and voting co-optees, 3.2, councillors only, and 3.3, councillors only. And then we move on to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and they have 3.4 and 3.5 recommendations uh, to consider. And I think we're going to take the recommendations in stages to make sure the right people vote at the right times. And I can clarify at any moment. <laughs> So I have been trying to also take a note of where, where people may be wanting to vote against specific parts of the recommendations so that we make sure we get coverage there. So initially I'm going to take paragraph 3.1.1, which is councillors and voting co-optees of children, young people and skills. So it's everybody on the front table to my right and Tom. Um, so 3.1.1, may I have a show of hands, all those in favour of 3.1.1? All those against? And any abstentions? Did you get that? And we're going to double check that we get it each time we, each time we move to a vote, okay? So we're, we're very clear on that. Uh, so paragraph 3.1.2, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? For the webcast, there were two votes against on 3.1.1 and 3.1.2. The remainder of those voting voted in favour. And the same for 3.1.3. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same count. Right, moving to councillors only, uh, paragraph 3.2.1, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? So that was eight in favour, two against. Paragraph 3.2.2, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same outcome. And 3.2.3, .3, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? It's a bit like halfway through Eurovision where you think you know who's going to win but you're still not sure. Um, moving on, again, councillors only. Uh, 
paragraph 3.3.1. All those in favour? Not yet, wait for it, Ken. All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same result. Eight in favour, two against. Paragraph 3.3.2. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same result. 3.3.3. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? Paragraph 3.3.4. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same result. Paragraph 3.3.5. All those in... Wait for it, Mo. All those in favour? <laughs> All those against? Any abstentions? At this point, I ought to point out people are going to start getting work-related upper limb disorders if they keep using the same arm. Um, paragraph 3.3.6, you get a break in a second. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. That concludes the voting of the Children, Young People and Skills Committee. Bon chance. Uh, Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, voting members, I will take paragraph 3.4.1. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? So that was, that was seven in favour and one against. Paragraph 3.4.2. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? That was the same result. Paragraph 3.4.3. .3. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? The same result again. And moving to section 3.5. 3.5.1. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? That was seven in favour, one against. 3.5.2, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? That was the same result. 3.5.3, .3, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And that was the same result. Paragraph 3.5.4, .4, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? Paragraph 3.5.5. .5, all those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? And paragraph 3.5.6. .6, all those in favour? All those against? A shocking result there. No, and that was the same result. I just... Yeah. So nobody can say there isn't any democracy in this joint committee. I think we've had enough votes to last a year or so. Right. I'd really like to thank everybody. I'd love to thank members of the public. I know this is incredibly emotional and, uh, and serious matter, and it's been really good to see, firstly, so many people in attendance. And I'd just like to thank you all for your behaviour and your contributions as well, both to the debate now, but also to the debate going forward, because we really do need people's views. You know, this isn't a done deal. This isn't a sold decision. This is now where the detailed work can begin, and your input's going to be absolutely crucial. And also thanks to all of the members and assorted co-optees and various people in attendance for all of their hard work and for the officers for all of their hard work too. It's not an easy report, as everyone's noted. Thank you very much.